Hello and welcome to the Extension Network. I'm Terry Carter, Cobb County Master Gardener and Program Assistant for the Family and Consumer Science Department here in the county. We have a great show lined up for you today. What I'm going to be talking about are recipes from a traditional southern garden. We have a rich history of food here in the south, growing our own food and preparing it. So what I kind of wanted to go over today was recipes that we can grow here and we have been growing for many years. We have a rich history. We call it southern food. Sometimes we call it comfort food. Sometimes we call it soul food. But it is the foods of the South. So when I was growing up with my grandparents in rural Alabama, we grew a lot of the things that we ate. So what I kind of wanted to grow, go over are those things that we grew in the garden and that we cooked. So first thing we're going to start with would be the succotash. Succotash is a very old recipe, yet it's a very simple recipe. Succotash is made uh, made up ma mostly of corn and lima beans. Some people add other things into it. You can add more. You can add tomatoes if you want to. Some people would even crumble a little bacon on top. But the succotash is very simple to make. It's lima beans, which can be grown in your garden, and it's corn. And of course, we grow corn in the garden too. So to make the succotash, all I did was, well, I actually added some yellow peppers in there. And you may not be able to see the yellow peppers because they blend in a little bit with the corn. But if you wanted to, you could add red bell pepper. You could add um, green bell pepper. You could add all three colored bell peppers to make it very colorful. But it's a very simple dish, easy to make. You take your corn on the cob, which we have here, and you're going to cut that corn off of the cob, simply taking a knife and going straight down that corn getting it off, and you're going to cook the lima beans and the corn. Now today, we use mostly frozen lima beans. So if you don't have all these things available, of course, you can use the frozen version of them. I try not to use canned version of these things, simply because the fresh or the frozen will taste a lot better. So to make the succotash, I cooked the lima beans. They were frozen lima beans first. And then I took my corn, and I took the corn off of the cob, added it to the lima beans after I poured the water off of the lima beans, Mix the two together. You can add in a little butter. You can add in a little olive oil to just um, saute it a little bit. Um, you could also, at the end of that, if you want it to be creamy, you could add in a little bit of heavy whipping cream to make a creamier succotash. It's totally up to you. I like it just the way it is. But that is very easy to grow, uh, to grow and to make as well. Now, the traditions of the South came from the beginning of people coming here to the South First, we had the Native Americans who have been here for a very long time. They grew what we call the Three Sisters method of planting. That's basically making the corn. They would plant the corn first. The corn stalk would grow up, get strong. Then they would plant the beans. The beans would grow around the corn stalk as the corn stalk would grow. And then they would plant squash. And the squash would cover the ground. So you have a nice ground cover that would prevent the weeds from growing. That's called the Three Sisters. And so we have all of that represented here. We have the corn, we have the beans, and we have the squash. Now the kind of uh, squash they grew, it will vary. We use a lot of summer squash here. That's what I have here, which is a traditional yellow crookneck squash or a summer squash. Now they also grew what we call winter squash. And what's the difference between the summer squash and the winter squash? Well, basically the summer squash has a very soft skin, so it won't last as long. The winter squash will last a very long time. I grew a winter squash this summer in my um, community garden plot over at Reconnecting Our Roots Garden. And um, I harvested it in October, and I kept it all winter long. And in March, I looked at it again. It was, still look, it was still looking really good. So you could grow a winter squash and save it until you needed it. This is why, this is how people would survive. They would grow the winter squash save it for the uh, winter and eat off it until the next spring and they would plant more. Um, that was easy to do and made and it, it made sure people were fed. So the summer squash is what we have today and to make the summer squash all I did was to slice the squash up and then I also sliced up onions, added a little bit of olive oil to that, added some water and sauteed that together. Now it depends on how well you want your squash, how long you cook it. I like for the squash and the onions to be cooked down fairly well, so I cook mine a long time. If you don't like for it to be cooked that long, you can stop that cooking process anytime you get ready. And that's easy, it's real simple to do. I added fresh cracked pepper to it, that gives it a really nice flavor and just a little bit of salt. So that's our summer squash. <clears throat> 
then um, my favorite thing here that I prepare, and all these dishes I prepared just ahead of time so I wouldn't have to cook them for you. This is probably my favorite dish. This is um, okra and tomatoes. I was raised on this stuff, and I started cooking it myself at a pretty early age. And we would have so many tomatoes available during the summer in the garden, um, or people would give us tomatoes that we had to do something with them. So um, we also grew a lot of okra, and if you've ever grown okra, you know that okra grows really fast. So um, a simple dish to make with that would be simply tomatoes and okra. And you just slice up your okra and you um, chop up the tomatoes. I took the skins off of the tomatoes, but of course you can leave the skins on there. They may not, it may not look as pretty with the skin, but it is healthy to eat the skins as well. Um, and you cook that down. I cook the tomatoes first simply because I wanted to make sure my tomatoes were pretty done. I'm not a big fan of tomatoes, so I like for them to be cooked pretty well. And then I just added my okra. You'll have some liquid from the tomatoes, but you still may need to add a little bit of liquid in there while you're sauteing it. And you simply cook that as long as you want to. Now this dish, sometimes people would add to, um, some onions to it, um, to the same dish. But I make a dish called okra and onions, which is separate. It's simply cooking the okra and cooking the um, onions together. So that's another entirely different dish. Now, the tomatoes and okra could be eaten just like this by itself, which is what I do, or you could eat it with rice. A lot of people would cook the rice and then put the okra and tomatoes over the rice. Um, I have here a very traditional dish of the South as well, rice and peas. And rice and peas is a dish that's eaten all over the world in some form or another. Um, rice is a traditional dish of the South. We grew a lot of rice in South Carolina. Um, so we're very used to having rice available here, but all over the world you have a dish of rice and peas. Now the kind of peas that would be used would be varied from where you were. Um, here in the south, of course, we grow field peas, black-eyed peas, purple hull peas, of course, and lima beans, cow peas, field peas, so many different peas we grow. So it really doesn't matter what kind of peas you use. I use a traditional uh, purple hull peas, pea here today, and that too could be canned, it could be frozen, or of course, it could be fresh, so it's up to you. Um, I love the tomatoes and okra with the rice and peas. So you have four dishes here, and really, you could interchange a lot of the different ingredients here and take it to a whole nother level. Um, but of course, uh, we want to talk a little bit about where did these foods come from? Uh, where did the tomatoes come from? How did these foods really become traditional foods of the South? Um, we talked about what the Native Americans contributed. Uh, mostly the corn, or uh, they would call it maize. Um, corn was used on a daily basis with the Native Americans. They grew mostly dent corn, and the difference between dent corn and sweet corn, which is what I have here today, is that sweet corn is what we eat um, in the form that it is. Dent corn was mostly used to make cornmeal. So corn has been around in the Americas for a very, very long time. In fact, when the Europeans arrived, um, they were introduced to it, and the Native Americans showed them how to use it and how to grow it, so it became a staple. Um, where did the tomatoes come from? The tomatoes came from, really, um, Europeans bringing the tomatoes over. Even though they originated in the Americas, for a long time, um, they weren't used here until Europeans came on the Mayflower. And for a long time, people thought tomatoes actually were, were poisonous, and that's very um, strange because we use them so much now. But the reason they thought they were poisonous is because um, some people would, would take the tomatoes and put them on the plates, and the plates were made out of pewter. And so the acid and the pewter, when, they, when it came together, would cause a reaction, and it would poison people. Well, what they found was that poor people were still eating the tomatoes, and they couldn't understand why poor people weren't getting poisoned. And the reason was because the poor people had to use wooden bowls and wooden plates. So, of course, that was different, and it didn't make them sick. Once that was figured out, um, the tomato came to America, and the rest is history, and we use the tomato all the time in a lot of different dishes. And, of course, tomatoes are so easy to grow here in the southeast that we use them all the time. And um, the okra. The okra was actually brought over on slave ships. The Africans used okra a lot, as well as um, a lot of different cowpeas. So the okra became a staple here in the south, and, of course, Okra grows so easily and it gets so tall, and as the season goes on, you'll have a, um, so much okra you don't know what to do with it. So you have to find ways to uh, use the okra. So that is how all of that came along. 
And so um, I'm going to do a really special dish for you today, and it's called farmer's caviar. And what the farmer's caviar is is actually a cold dish. And so I'm going to compose that based on all these things you see up here. And so the first thing I'm going to do for the farmer's caviar is to make the sauce. And again, this is a cold salad. And I like the farmer's caviar because if you're going to a picnic, you want to take something a little different than our traditional uh, potato salad or coleslaw. This is a very healthy dish. Everything in it is fresh. So I'm going to show you how to compose this dish. And you can make this ahead of time. The first thing I'm going to do is to um, make the dressing for it. And everything here is made from scratch. Some people use a bottle salad dressing. I never do that. Um, I always make my own salad dressing because making your salad dressing it's the base of it is vinegar and olive oil. Both of those things are very healthy for you. So if you make it yourself, you're getting your healthiest version of a dressing without adding a whole bunch of unnecessary things. So let's go ahead and compose our salad dressing, and then we'll add our other ingredients in there. So for the salad dressing, we have a third of a cup of olive oil. Here's our olive oil. And if the olive oil is a little too strong for you, you can use a lighter version of the olive oil. You could mix your olive oil with canola oil or some other kind of oil. Some people just don't like the taste of a strong olive oil. Okay, so we've added a third of a cup of olive oil. We're going to take two tablespoons of red wine vinegar and add that. Um, and if you don't like the red wine vinegar, you could add another kind of vinegar, rice vinegar, balsamic vinegar, or even apple cider vinegar. Whatever kind of vinegar you choose to use in this dish, that's totally up to you. And our next thing would be two tablespoons of lime juice. So here's our lime juice. And of course, I'm using fresh lime juice. You could use the one in the little thing that looks like a lime, but of course, fresh is going to taste much better. That's the whole concept behind this. This is totally fresh, and it's going to be really nice, nice and light for the summertime. Um, next, we're going to add a teaspoon of sugar. And next, we'll have a teaspoon of garlic salt. And I didn't have garlic salt, so what I used was garlic powder and salt, and I mixed it together. Hence, we have garlic salt, just made from scratch. And next, we'll have the teaspoon of oregano. And that is dried oregano that we're using. You could use fresh, but um, I'm using dry. And then kosher salt and fresh ground pepper. All right, so that's um, the basis of our salad dressing. And I'm just going to mix all this together. Now, if you wanted to, you could have uh, mixed this in a jar or something else and then poured it over. I found it just as easy to mix it up in a bowl. You just have to make sure you incorporate all of your ingredients well into this, okay? Kind of make an emulsion with this. If you can see that, it's emulsifying as these ingredients come together. All right, that's our salad dressing. Looks really good to me. It's all mixed in. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and add our vegetables. And the first thing we have is a, a pound of frozen purple hull peas. And I'll be honest with you, I cheated a little bit because I did try the frozen purple hull peas. I had some issues with that. They were breaking apart. The skins were coming off. So I improvised and I used the can um, purple hull peas. Um, and actually, those are the peas that um, were falling apart because I just wanted the peas to look very pretty in here. And if they're falling apart, it's not going to look as nice. So these are actually canned purple hull peas. And all you have to do is take the can of peas and um, drain them completely, and you have this. So we're going to add those in first. Um, next ingredient would be a pound of baby lima beans. And here are frozen lima beans. I'm going to add those in as well. Okay, and next, I'm going to mix those up a little bit. Okay, and then next we have um, three-fourths a cup of shoe peg corn kernels. All right, so here are shoe peg corn. Um, this is canned. Now, if you wanted to use fresh corn, you could use fresh corn. Actually, I would love to use the fresh corn in here, but the recipe called for shoe peg corn. And shoe peg corn is a little different than regular corn. Um, it's a different variety of corn. It's very crunchy and very nice, and it does cost a little bit more than your regular canned corn, probably going to be about 50 to 75 cents more than your regular canned corn, but it um, goes very nicely in this salad. So I'm going to mix those up a little bit. Mix, 
We'll mix a little bit as we go to make sure everything gets incorporated in. All right, and then next we have, um, a half, it calls for a half of a red bell pepper and a half of a green bell pepper. Well, here's your green bell pepper. I really didn't like the green bell pepper because I prefer the taste of a colored bell pepper. And so I have uh, red bell peppers and I also have yellow bell peppers. Now, bell peppers come in an array of colors. You have red, you have yellow, you have orange, you have purple, and of course you have green. Um, so I wanted to add color, so I'm going to add the red. And it should be a half of a bell pepper. It should, it should come out to be a whole bell pepper. So um, we have half red and then half of the yellow, and it's a little less than half yellow. It's more red than yellow, but that's fine. And as you can see, we're starting to really get some color here um, in our salad, and I love that color. So you can imagine if you added yet a third um, colored bell pepper, how it would turn out. Be even prettier with the colors, and it's really coming together nicely. I love the way this is looking. All right, and then next we're adding um, one small jalapeno. And that's one small chopped jalapeno. And if you really like it hot, you could add more. And what you really want to do is to taste your jalapeno because they're not all created equal. Some jalapeno peppers are going to be hotter than others. Um, so you really want to taste this before you add it in. But I'm going to go ahead and add all of this in. I hope it's not too hot. Some people like it spicy. Some people don't. So if you don't like it spicy, don't add it at all or add just a little bit to it, okay? So there we go with that. And let me see what else do we have. All right, one third cup of loose leaf. Uh, loose, oh, I forgot the red onion. Here's our red onion. Okay, so we're going to add that. Now the onion. I have quite a bit of onion here. And when it said one um, red onion, this is the onion that I use, and that's pretty big. So if that's too much uh, onion for you, you can just go ahead and cut that back a little bit. This is actually less than one onion here. So this is probably about three-fourths of an onion that size. Um, I love onions. I love the crunch of it, so I would add a lot of it. Um, so we have our onion. And the last but not least is the cilantro. And I really love cilantro. It adds a really nice flavor. So we're going to put our cilantro in there. And you can chop the cilantro up as much as you like. I kind of left it in the whole leaf form. And so we're just going to kind of toss this together. This is an easy way of tossing without really damaging your vegetables because you don't want your peas to get all mushed here. And that's all you have to do. Now this salad can be made well ahead of time. Um, what I would suggest you do with this, oops, what I would suggest you do with this um, would be to go ahead and chop up all of your vegetables ahead of time because if you don't chop up your vegetables ahead of time, you're going to be spending a lot of time trying to get this together. I did all this chopping yesterday and put everything in a plastic bag overnight. So for one, your vegetables will be cold, and you want them to be cold um, because this is really a salad that's served cold or at room temperature. So um, doing your vegetables ahead of time and refrigerating them gives you an opportunity to, to have everything cold. So this is basically it. You take a look at that. Um, you have all of the vegetables here. You have all of the colors here. And look how healthy this is. And this is a salad that you can take anywhere. Um, there's really very little cooking involved. I had to cook the lima beans. I would not suggest that you um, use canned lima beans. Sometimes canned lima beans can be too soft. Um, I use the frozen ones. And you have to really keep tasting it because you don't want them to be overcooked and you don't want them to be undercooked. And the peas, you... Like I said, I think the canned peas work much better in this dish than the frozen because we had a hard time trying to get those frozen peas cooked. And so I just feel it's better to go ahead and use the canned peas instead. And this is your salad. Now let's talk a little bit about um, what variations we could have done here. We could have done a lot of different variations here with this salad. Um, we could have used a different kind of pea. We could have used cow peas. You could have used black beans. So you can change a lot about this recipe and put in here whatever you want. You could use less peppers, you could use less um, uh, onions, so it's totally up to you what you do with this salad. You can make it your own and the most important thing I would say is to make sure you make your salad dressing delicious um, and that's the most important thing, but you can vary this. Make this salad your own, do it however you want. Okay, and that's our salad dressing. And once again, everything up here pretty much can be grown in your own backyard. 
if you have a little space. And uh, looking at all of these things here, everything here can be grown in your um, garden except for, of course, the lime. And the lime will be grown maybe in Florida. That's the closest place. Some people try and grow limes here in Georgia, but it's pretty difficult to um, grow them. So um, in closing, just want to say that I hope you try this salad. It is delicious. And I just wanted to mention also that I will be doing a cooking, a series of cooking classes at Hyde Park um, Farm. And those are at no cost to you. You just have to call here at the Extension Office and register for that. And the first one will be this month, June 8th. And all of them will be on Saturday mornings from 11 until 12. And if you haven't been to Hyde Park Farm, I encourage you to go out there. It's beautiful. You can walk around. There's a lake. There's an old working farm there, but it's a great place to go out. Um, so on June 8th, come out to the first, and it's going to be called Cooking with Superfoods and Cooking from Seed to Table. So I'll not only be cooking, I'll also be talking about how to grow food, how to save seeds, and anything that you wanted to know about gardening. It's pretty much seed to table. I'll talk about saving seeds, how to germinate seeds, how to transplant, um, how to preserve those foods, and how to cook them, of course. So it's called Cooking with Superfoods. And there will be four classes, and I hope you'll join us for all four. The first is, of course, June 8th. The second will be July 13th. The third one will be September 21st. And the last one will be on November 9th. So please join us for that. And I hope you've enjoyed our show. Thank you so much. Grant University system was created to advance agricultural and mechanical sciences 150 plus years ago. And we realized that some of the research that was coming from out of the land grants, it was not reaching the people. So the Smith-Lever Act was passed 100 years ago. The purpose of that act was to create the Cooperative Extension Service, which was to take the research that was created by the land grant universities and actually give it to the people who could use it. And so that was the genesis for the creation of the Extension Service, or the Cooperative Extension Service, as it was called at that time. It was to take the research-based information from the university, from that land-grant school, and get it to the people who need it so that they could use it to improve their lives, their economy, and to improve agriculture. Well, I lived on a farm until I went off to be in the Navy and, and, and to go to college. And my father was a very fine and aggressive farmer. And of course, the source of our advice when Daddy wanted to do something better or learn about a new species of uh, peanut or cotton or corn was to go to the Extension Service and they gave him whatever advice he needed. And it, and it was just like a constant source of uh, inspiration and advice and counsel, and sometimes correction when he was doing something wrong. And as I grew older and, and when I came back from the Navy and spent the next 17 years as a full-time farmer, I saw firsthand the great value of what the Extension Service offered to everyone in our county, not just farmers, but everybody in the the merchants and others who did business with uh, farmers and depended on agricultural income. My earliest experience with the Cooperative Extension Service came as a result of joining the 4-H Club when I was probably in a middle school age group. They encouraged us to participate in competitions and we had to learn our various project areas and make presentations in the local and the district competitions and also uh, I began to show livestock as a part of my 4-H project and continued to do that for a number of years. So. 
the Cooperative Extension Service and its supervision of 4-H uh, was an important part of my younger years. I serve Fulton County. It's a large county. We don't have that many farmers, but we have a lot of people. And we have a lot of families that just simply need help. So Extension brings that human touch to our community. We answer the questions directly. We give it to you in a manner that you can understand and you can use, and you can apply it immediately. So Extension is kind of like that friend next door. You may not talk to them every day, but you're really glad that they're there. One of the advantages that we have is that we're always on the cutting edge of the newest information, the newest research that's coming out of the University of Georgia. And we are a direct source that our clients can come to to find that information. We're a filter for that information. And we are able to explain it in a way that people can use it for practical everyday application, whether it's on the farm, in their families, or in their communities. An increasingly important element of Georgia's and in, in, a United, in America's total production of food will have to be designed toward meeting the needs of our own country and other nations more than it has been in the past. So I think the, the gamut of, of, of influence of extension service, I don't think has been minimized in recent uh, modern days, but I think the opportunities to expand their influence has been greatly increased now and I believe in the future. I think the future for cooperative extension across the nation is very strong, and I know in our state it is. The simple problems in agriculture have been solved, and they've been solved for the last hundred years or so. Uh, only complex problems remain. Our researchers on our land-grant universities working in multidisciplinary teams will provide solutions for these complex and complicated problems. But how you transfer that information back to the farmer, back to the agribusiness, back to the, the family or the, the youth development specialists through 4-H is going to be very different. Uh, that's where corporate extension has always been good. That's what their strength is. And that's where we see them being so important in the future. We're continuing to see evolution in the production of agricultural products. And I expect that to continue. We will probably have uh, fewer farms, but larger farms. And the Cooperative Extension Service certainly has a role to play in that new structure. They've adapted very well to the changing circumstances and the changing economy of our country over the last hundred years. And I have every reason to believe that they will continue to do that here in Georgia for the next hundred years. The most rewarding part of my job is being able to help people and provide current research-based information for our clients. They come to us over and over for that information because they see us as the number one source of information that they can rely upon, whether it's for their farm, their agribusiness, or for their families. Real life changes. Extension brings real life changes, and being that agent in the community, on the ground, being that agent to serve is a pretty miraculous thing. In all the ways that I had an early developmental life in earning a living and learning how to live uh, as a productive citizen, I would say the extension service had a major beneficial effect on me.